are honored to have with us Attorney General Patrick Morrissey. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good to be with you. So, um, how are you doing? You're a busy guy these days. You know, look, things are going very well. I have to tell you that the last couple of years we've been on a really good roll in terms of the kind of cases we're working on and the, the wins we've had in court. And I think we're really doing a lot of incredibly impactful work protecting jobs in West Virginia, uh, putting together the structure uh, to deal with the drug epidemic in our state. That, you know, that's been nine, ten years coming, and we finally were able to put together an agreement where every county and virtually every city came together not only on a plan for how to fight the drug epidemic, but how the money is going to be distributed. And it's nice to see the fruits of your labor, but we still have more work to do. I mean, just because you're making progress doesn't mean it's over, but it's been a nice stretch. And I'm really hopeful that I get to come on and report on some of the progress of these activities to you, uh, that people realize that you can make progress in these positions if you keep your nose to the grindstone and you focus on things and you're able to build large coalitions to get things done. And that's what we've been doing. So everything's good. Yeah, you know, Pat, we were in the first half hour, we were talking about um, the educational system. We started talking about, uh, uh, is it Pat Huggins? Uh, Bob. Bob. Bob Huggins, Huggins I'm sorry. Big and basketball fan, John Gilstrap. Not, not, <laughs> not the least bit of a basketball fan, John Gilstrap. Uh, but with the lawsuits and such that are going on, he's a state employee. Does your office get involved with all of that? Well, it certainly can get involved, so I'll kind of hold some of my comments sure. uh, for now. Uh, but obviously, WVU over the years had secured a separate ability to handle some of their own legal issues. And so some state agencies had that authority over time. WVU had much of that before I became attorney general, and they've kept that. So I think most of that work would be done either in-house or by um, per potentially outside counsel for WVU. I will say this. I do think there's always value in ensuring that the AG's office uh, can be involved in state-related matters. As a matter of law, we do have the ability to get involved in anything where the state has a legal interest. Now, practically... You can't get involved in everything because you just don't have the resources to be involved in every single fight. Uh, but I do think it's important that people know that the AG's office has the ability to state a legal interest of the state when it wants in court. And we obviously frequently do that. So when a, when a lawsuit is filed against the state of West Virginia, is the attorney general's office responsible for are you the de yeah, by, is the office by, the defense for the state first of all by default the attorney general's office gets notified of all the litigation and in most cases we will be involved in representing the defense of the state agency and there are some situations though where as i mentioned some of the state agencies have been granted uh, power by the legislature to handle um, some of that uh, uh, that work, and yet we still will always know about it. And most of the time, we're in defending the state agency. But where we believe that there's a compelling state legal interest, we do have the ability to independently weigh in and assert that. So, in other words, uh, we're one of the only places around where. Uh, every state agency is going to get its representation, but also the people get it, get their voice, right? So, um, for instance, there are scenarios where one state agency sued another state agency, and they were both asserting what the law was governing their behavior. And uh, in that one scenario, we actually stepped in and we asserted what we thought the state interests were because we wanted to get it correct. And so... Uh, it's it's an odd situation because it is dealing with an entity that's charged with the legal defense of state agencies. Uh, but we've, I think, handled it very well over the years. And, you know, we've handled it carefully, but uh, the AG's office is a little bit different than uh, other law firms. 
Is there, Patrick, is there anything big that you see coming down the road as far as something that you guys are monitoring, looking at, that you think the state may have to jump into, your, the AG's office may have to jump into to protect the interests of the citizens of West Virginia? Well, I think the biggest thing going right now is we're really under assault by a lot of the federal regulations, and in particular the EPA. Uh, over the last week, a lot of people have seen that we've been out pushing back against uh, what the Biden administration is trying to do with electric vehicles. And look, uh, I never take any issue with the development of technology. Uh, what I do take issue with is when the government tries to force market-changing regulations in place that it lacks the authority uh, to implement. And that's exactly what's happening here. You have an effort to change the marketplace and force uh, 67% of Americans to have electric vehicles by 2032 when there really is no authority to do that. And so we have weighed in because we think this has a disproportionately negative impact here in West Virginia. And guys, for those who are not familiar with this regulation, they're trying to move aggressively toward electric vehicles, but they're doing so by really going after the internal combustion engine and by doing that, they're trying to make it so it's utterly unaffordable uh, to buy cars. What's, it's fascinating because electric vehicles right now, many of them are about 10000 bucks more than a traditional uh, pickup truck or a car with an internal combustion engine. And so by forcing more and more uh, people to move in this direction, by kind of setting up what the mile per gallon standards are, that's a huge problem for a state like ours where people do a lot of driving and uh, we don't have the charging stations in place. And not only that, even if you had all the charging stations in place, there are real concerns about baseload power because at the same time they're trying to move forward with electric vehicles. They're trying to get rid of the remaining coal fire power plants and gas plants and that math just doesn't add up. So I think that's a really big one that we're working on. We're co-leading on that. And people are going to hear about it a lot more. Well, didn't didn't they say that in California when they came out with all the new regulations out there? And then, like two weeks later, the governor said, "Hey, nobody charge your electric cars during the day. It's really hot out. We need that electricity for air conditioning." I mean, well, yeah, I mean, you hear you, know, you hear stupid statements like that, right? Because what happens is that uh, there is a limit in terms of what you can do when you're wiping out the sources of the base load energy, right? And West Virginia has been used to relying on coal for a long period of time. It still has at least 86% of the energy for the power grid comes from coal. And so you can't, with one hand, wipe away the source of the power, and on the other hand, mandate the use of electric power. So it's, it's really crazy. And I, I find the duplicity to be unreal because real people are going to get hurt. And you know, what do you say to West Virginians who are already struggling with inflation and have a lower standard of living than other states that we touch, that we're going to increase the cost of the cars that they have to purchase by $10,000 or more. And it's, it's a huge issue. How do you go about, Patrick, attacking legislation or, or ideas, or maybe even executive orders that uh, an administration may put forth in an effort like this against a combustion engine and trying to force people into uh, the, the EVs? I mean, what, what type of steps, how, how can you attack that? Yeah, a couple of things. First, what we do is we look at everything that comes out the door, right? And we go through it because we know that it's the job of the attorney general to go through these regulations and to evaluate where West Virginia interests are being impacted. I can step in when there are West Virginia legal interests that are impacted, and that's what we do. So we evaluate every rule and every issue that comes down the pike, and then we determine whether we have the standing to go in and challenge that. And first, if there's a, a recognizable West Virginia interest, we thought, okay, well, can we prove that there's some concrete or direct injury? And then if we can, <clears throat> we will decide, okay, this is something we might be able to go in on. First, you start with writing comments. This is what we did with the tailpipe emissions and the electric cars. Uh, we co-led a 25-state effort with Kentucky about the unlawful proposal coming out 
on electric vehicles. Then if the Biden administration ignores that and they go ahead and finalize the rule, then we can step up and we may have the ability to sue or we can work with other states or private parties to do that. So, you know, I I think the number one issue is, does it affect West Virginia? Does it um, affect our Constitution and our way of life here? And does that warrant uh, putting in the resources to change? And I do get calls about literally every issue that people want to have five, ten people uh, diverted to focus on one issue or another. And I'm sympathetic, quite frankly, because we live in a large world and there are a lot of wrongs to undo. And what I tell you is that we punch a lot bigger than our weight class. We do a lot more than states who are similarly sized in terms of the legal initiatives that we lead. Uh, But the AG's office can't do everything with the resources we have. And I I try to prioritize to what I think are the most important challenges facing the state. How do you protect our jobs? How do you address the drug epidemic? How do you protect West Virginia values? And that's what we focus on every day. Patrick, even if uh, an EPA ruling goes, if they issue a final rule under the current administration, the EPA is, does not have lawmaking power, right? So can't it be overturned by the next president and the next EPA uh, director or secretary? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the EPA is bound by, if you have the next executive and they follow the rules, they withdraw the rulemaking and they uh, go through a separate rulemaking process, absolutely. Uh, You can do that. But one of the things we've focused on over the recent years is that uh, these unelected bureaucrats have really been seizing power that's not their own. And so we've had a concentrated effort to review abuse of agency power, and we've obviously been successful in those challenges. Uh, Some people listening may be familiar with the case West Virginia v. EPA, where we were able to prevail against the Biden Green New Deal agenda, and that really hurt West Virginia. But what people may not realize about that case is that the basic issue involved whether unelected bureaucrats kind of reach into their bag of tricks and seize on some ambiguous piece of statute and try to use it to reorder the nation's power grid. And the court said no, that when it comes to a major question of the day, Congress not the unelected bureaucrats gets to make the decisions. And so that's a really big issue. And you you see cases like that or the Waters United States rule. I know farmers in Jefferson County and uh, contractors in Berkeley County and uh, real estate um, uh, salesmen and other people who are impacted by the Waters United States rule because private property owners don't know whether you're backyard ditch or ephemeral stream is being regulated by the federal government. And these things matter to West Virginians because they impact um, what you can do with your own land, what you can do with your own skill set, uh, and certainly what you can do when the federal government's not getting the middle of all of your activity. You mentioned these um, unelected leaders and, and, and particular departments and so forth may be seizing power. How much of it is them seizing power or how much of it do you see as administrations kind of giving them that power to bypass the system? You know, I, I think there's probably a combination of, of both. So interestingly, uh, when you look at the growth of the administrative state, Um, I would argue that there's been abuse for a number of reasons, right? You have a Congress that's frequently abdicated its responsibility, and they may send up language that's not terribly clear because perhaps they're trying to be all things to all people and reach a deal between war and sorts and say, look, we're not going to resolve everything here, but you can save that fight to the rulemaking process. (laughs) And so... Congress sometimes might be intentionally clear or unclear in its, in its decision-making. But there's been other problems as well. Sometimes Congress gets really, really lazy. They don't go through and they're not careful about how they authorize these agencies' powers. Or they bundle all of the appropriations bills up together 
and you have this one big omnibus bill, and so all the legislators are left with a gun to their head. It's a take it or leave it uh, approach, and you may have these thousand page bills. No one knows really what's in those thousand page bills, but sometimes the agency is getting massive sums of money, and an individual lawmaker may disagree with that, but they may agree with 10 other pieces, and they're they're really put in a difficult spot with a gun to their head. And so there's been so much abuse of the process. Congress is part to blame. The executive branch is part to blame. <clears throat> Quite frankly, the judicial branch, branch is part to blame because they came up with a concept where the courts deferred to these agencies uh, just simply because they were agencies. That's a separate issue, this deference that the agencies get instead of just reading the plain language of the statute and following the Constitution. So uh, there's a lot of blame to go around, but it's up to people like me and the AGs across the country to say, hey, listen, we're going to get back to how our Constitution is interpreted, and we're going to get back to doing things the right way, respecting the separation of powers between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the uh, judicial branch. And that's certainly what we do. And with all that in mind, it comes back to West Virginia. How do you put West Virginia first? How do you do the right thing for your state that gives our citizens the opportunity to keep their jobs, to improve their standard of living, enhance educational attainment, and live in a safe place where the drug epidemic is is low, and also where people respect the rule of law and it's applied the same way to everyone blind to political affiliation or economic status. That's got to be the goal of an attorney general, and certainly in ten and a half years of the job, I've tried to never deviate from it. Hey, Patrick, let's shift gears real quick. The, uh, the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action on college campuses, how does that affect West Virginia and our schools? It affects West Virginia because, first of all, we get engaged where the rule of law is impacted. And if you're talking about college admissions and there's a case up at the U.S. Supreme Court, well, we have plenty of colleges here in West Virginia. So uh, I don't think that West Virginians want to have disparate treatment on the basis of race or ethnicity or sex. And so when these larger cases come in, they're going to govern how all of the state's admission policies are going to be set up. Yeah, most assuredly, that impacts West Virginia interests because we want, to, we want to make sure that the right thing occurs. So, you know, in that particular case, we weighed in. Uh, we signed on to a brief with, by one of my colleagues, and uh, we, we thought that the right result occurred because I personally want to have admissions on the basis of merit as opposed to based on race or ethnicity. And so I think the Supreme Court got it right. You know, there was another case as well relating to religious freedom. We wrote that brief, and uh, we may ask, well, why did we write a brief with the Supreme Court this term? Well, we wrote the brief because a postal worker was going to get uh, really unable to perform his job because he said he didn't want to work on Sundays because he had deeply held religious beliefs. And, you know, that some of this stuff can happen in West Virginia as well. And you look at issues that you want to make sure that you're weighing in broadly. And so there are a lot of really direct interests. And then there are things that could happen anywhere, including West Virginia. And you want to make sure that the right rules of the road apply. Does is there a ripple effect to the affirmative action ruling that will, uh, for example, there are traditionally black colleges, there are traditional, uh, um, traditionally women's colleges and such. Does are those affected by this rule in terms of uh, race, taking a, a, a student's race into consideration? You know, I, I think that we're going to have to see how this plays out. Uh, but I think that the court tried to weigh in on the basis of, of the affirmative action policies that were set forth by the uh, college admission boards looking at Harvard and looking at North Carolina. So I, I do think that there's still room for these historically black colleges. Without a doubt, I don't see that changing, uh, but I, I know that there is probably gonna be a lot of analysis as to what happens. But I think what the court did, which was correct, is say, look, uh, these affirmative action policies 
where you're trying to treat one class of people as being uh, really beneath another class, you can't do. And I know that, you know, if you're looking at a historically black a college, um, that's not limited to just individuals of a particular race. And so I think that there's still an ability to keep the core of what a lot of these entities want to do, but to do it, once again, the right way that's kind of blind to uh, race-based treatment or uh, policies that are going to discriminate. Patrick, how did the uh, how did the case come out as far as the uh, gentleman or lady who worked at the Postal Service and didn't want to work on Sundays? Yeah, so that came out, and we were able to, to win that case, uh, and it was a, a pretty strong vote up at the U.S. Supreme Court. And what they did is that they really looked and evaluated, uh, because whenever you have these religious liberty cases, they look as to whether there's some form of accommodation that's provided to someone. And so the government can't come in and simply say, you know, you can't work on a particular Sunday or, or I'm sorry, you, you have to work on a particular day that violates your religious beliefs. And so uh, I, 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 I know that that is a, a case that drew uh, the vast majority of the Supreme Court uh, justices on the same side. They got it right. That's nice. I'm going to change uh, track completely, Patrick, and just ask, how is the candidacy going? And uh, uh, how do you kind of find dividing your time for your duties as an AG and your running for office? You know, I, I think it's been a great stretch. And hopefully you can tell I'm still in the middle of my day job. Mm -hmm. And we do it every day. And we uh, spend a lot of time because it's a great job. It's a, it's a great way to help. West Virginia citizens every single day. So I still believe that I have a duty to the people of the state and we're still working very hard in the arena. Um, and I, I just last week was down at one of the opioid meetings and I'll be down at a lot of the other opioid meetings in the upcoming days. Uh, so the day job always takes uh, precedence, but the campaign's going well. And here's why the campaign's going well. I think when people look at all the candidates, there's some good people. There's going to be some good ideas. But they're going to look and say there's one guy, one proven conservative in their arena who's taken on all the big fights that affect West Virginia, whether it's protecting jobs, whether it's fighting for advanced educational attainment, whether it's protecting our Second Amendment rights or going after waste, fraud, and abuse and a running uh, – state government the right way there's only one and i mean this there's one candidate who's a proven conservative who's been able to move the needle on a lot of the big challenges facing west virginia and i think voters know that and that's why we've been earning the support that we have and i think that's why um, we're, we're in a really strong position uh, to win this race but i don't take anything for granted you know there are people that are going to come in they might have a name they may have you know, a lot of the support that flows from having that name. And uh, we're going to keep working hard to earn the voters' trust. I think, though, the difference that I would offer up is, unlike everyone else who's going to promise the moon and the stars, when we say things, we deliver. And I think that we have a record in the last 10 and a half years of showing that. And I think people, especially in the eastern panhandle, know that. Uh, I'm still, you know, I come back a lot. Uh, the Eastern Panhandle is home to me, and uh, I want to make sure people know that uh, every reach of the state is going to have a voice under my watch, and it certainly has in the AG's office. Well, Patrick, I cannot thank you enough to spend for spending this time with us this morning. We have to move on to a break. I hope you have a really great day. Hey, thanks so much, guys. Appreciate it. All right, take care.